This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are talking with Paula Baker about her new book, Curbing Campaign Cash, Henry Ford, Truman Newberry, and the Politics of Progressive Reform. Paula Baker is an associate professor of history at Ohio State University, and she is currently working on a book entitled The American Political Industry, which will provide a detailed history of campaign finance legislation attempts, reform attempts in America. Paula, great to have you on the show. Thank you. I uh, wanted to ask you, you you've written a, a really interesting book about the Michigan Senate race of 1918, which featured one man we know very well. We know his, his name and his impact on this country, Henry Ford, and also a lesser-known figure, Truman Newberry, who faced off for the Senate seat that was, that was open for that election. Uh, how did you come upon the Michigan Senate race of, of 1918, uh, and, and why, why should we be uh, uh, you know, attuned to uh, the history of that uh, campaign, and, uh, and what, you know, what, what does it have for us regarding campaign finance reform? What does it teach us? Well, let's see. Uh, lots of questions there. Um, one goes back to the original design that I had for the general history of campaign finance, which still uh, moves from the idea that campaigns are businesses, and so I began to, so my approach was to think of it as uh, as a business and approach it almost as a, as a set of business school cases. And this was uh, one of my cases out of, a, of a, out of a whole long series. The case approach turned out to really get out of hand, and actually this case was one that demonstrated to me that the case approach wasn't working, where it had too many angles, had uh, too much going on to be truncated, and wound up going and living on its own. And so the American political industry now moves much more in a chronological direction, still with the idea that campaigns are... Uh, usefully approached as businesses that have needs for capital, yes, but also workers, also uh, communication, and therefore thinking about finance alone winds up being uh, way too narrow and uh, self-defeating in connection with reform. That on the other, so uh, kicking that out of the way, uh, this as a case seemed to be a no-brainer in that project because it was the first test case really that was developed through the court system uh, in connection with the first full-blown campaign finance legislation in the United States at the federal level. And so, so you're saying, it, uh, the, let, me, let me ask you, so this, this campaign between Henry Ford and Truman Newberry, and I want to come back and ask you how Henry Ford got involved and, and wanted to be uh, a United States senator, because that, that seems kind of interesting uh, from what I know of Henry Ford. But in thinking about um, the, the regulatory campaign spending, what piece of legislation is involved uh, in this race, that, and, and who's, who's accused of violating it? Uh, 19, uh, in 1910, 1911, a uh, strange bidding war takes place. There's concern about uh, campaign finance, uh, previously, there had been legislation dealing with uh, public employees, and there had been uh, the, the Tillman Act before this that had to do with corporate uh, financing of uh, uh, corporate contributions to uh, to campaigns. Um, the 1910-1911 Corrupt Practices Act deals more you know, broadly and tries to uh, there's this kind of funky bidding war that takes place in the Senate, uh, in particular, that has to do with capping the amounts that campaigns for Congress and the Senate, capping the amount that they could spend, and uh, also rolling in at that point uh, limitations on corporations' ability to um, contribute to campaigns. So that's the legislation at issue. It uh, the violator in this case is not Henry Ford, who 
decided that he would not spend any announced that he would not spend any money whatsoever to uh, to run for the Senate, and he uh, whether or not he did is, uh, um, is is harder to say. This is the kind of thing that Ford would have dealt with uh, right. with cash and not with. And any uh, contributions that were publicized, and under the Federal Corrupt pra- Practices Act, this was all supposed to be publicized as contributions were supposed to be publicized as well. But um, Truman Newberry um, and and his and his managers were, and basically the whole campaign team were accused of uh, violating the Corrupt Practices Act. It seems the background when we think about campaign finance reform, and you know, one reads a lot of the criticisms of it that, in many respects, particularly with regard to McCain-Feingold, um, which is our major legislation of uh, of our time, the you know, it protects incumbents uh, because they have the name recognition, uh, they already have uh, you know a war chest, uh, they have they, they've done a lot of things for people. I mean, they can all point to these achievements uh, in re-election campaigns. And how does how do how do you challenge that? And and one way is is to run a really effective, well-financed campaign. And it seems to me in this race that's clearly uh, involved. I mean, Truman Newberry is uh, as you write, he's he's from an old money Detroit family. Uh, he is he's served in the military, served in the Navy. He's not in the state. The Federal Corrupt Practices Act, the way I read it had severe limitations. I think what it would be $60,000 in today's money. Is that mm-hmm. right? Yep. On, on what you could spend. And, uh, of course, there was one huge loophole in that uh, contributions from outside or, you know, from uh, others that you could raise, you could spend that. Uh, you had a much larger cap on that. Uh, it was just your own money that you, you were severely limited on. So how does Truman Newberry compete? And he puts together, uh, it seems like a modern campaign. He's got a money-raising operation. He's got a media operation. And he's really driving uh, on issues. One issue in particular that's in play you write about is uh, the League of Nations. And are, are we going to join or not join? And Newberry is a no vote. And Wilson is a yes, or excuse me, Ford is a, a yes vote. Um, is that, I mean, it seems to me that's, that's part of what's going on uh, behind, behind the scenes in terms of Truman Newberry trying to gain an edge. Although he, he's not, I mean, you write about it, he's not actively campaigning, but the people in his campaign are. It was a really strange campaign. Um, where neither candidate campaigns, and on top of it, uh, by the time we get to October of 1918, the influenza influenza uh, epidemic is in full swing in uh, and affecting Michigan, and so there's a ban for that matter even on public meetings. So the candidates otherwise weren't about to go out and and campaign for themselves uh, in any event, and so. So they never appear, they never speak for themselves, and it's almost, it's, it's quite modern in that uh, everything is, is basically a media campaign. Now, and was that common to, uh, I mean, this, uh, at, in, that, in that period uh, no, at a Senate I think that's race? No, that's part of uh, what uh, really scared the Senate. <laughs> that, um, that there was an actual campaign. That, uh, you know, here was uh, a guy, uh, Truman Newberry, that... Uh, was again, as you say, a well off uh, individual from relatively old money, at least his, his father had uh, uh, amassed a bit of a fortune and uh, Truman Newberry himself and expanded upon it through his own investments. So there is that. Uh, and But otherwise, he doesn't have a pile of name recognition. He had run for Congress once in the past in this kind of half-hearted way without uh, uh, winning, for that matter, the Republican, uh, the Republican primary. And so he had very little name recognition, and so here's this guy with very little re- name recognition, but he does have some funds, and here's what you can do with a, with a media campaign. At a, at a moment in time, when people are starting to get to be uh, oh, sensitive about the whole question of, of propaganda coming out of, uh, uh, you know, having witnessed what, um, you know, propaganda might accomplish in the course of World War I. Mm-hmm. So uh, you could imagine how senators seeing, seeing this, say, uh, you know, incumbents themselves saying, oh, my God, <laughs> you yeah. know, this, uh, this can happen to us. 
So, and so there is that uh, that incumbent protection, kind of low ground sure. part of this going on. Sure. sure. Um, and um, uh, there's uh, there's incumbent uh, protection going on. There is uh, um, also, it seems to me, the the question of, in this case, fame, where incumbents certainly have an advantage in uh, in running for election. They already have organizations and. Uh, name recognition and all of that, but uh, you know, no one beats Henry Ford for name recognition. Yeah. Certainly in Michigan and pretty much anywhere at that moment. Um, and all of the kind of bad publicity around Ford hasn't really happened yet. Okay. So okay. it's uh, it's a pretty much a clean slate, and Ford still turns up more or less as a hero with the controversial part of Ford's public persona at this moment having to do with his uh, support for or his you know, support for the League of Nations uh, for the League of Nations and before that his efforts to keep the United States out of out of World War one I want to ask you um, if, I mean I thought this was interesting but I guess uh, fits very well with uh, first wave progressive political philosophy Henry Ford enters both the Republican and Democratic primaries. Uh, I assume the message he's sending is he's above narrow partisanship, uh, mm -hmm. narrow party interest. He is, uh, you know, about uh, the good, the, the the common good. We might say for for all of Michigan and, yeah. and the world. And, and the world. Yeah. <laughs> Truman Newberry, yeah. of course, is is a Republican. He's not about just Michigan. He's, he's, he's about yes. the world. He's got yeah. a. He's got, okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, which you know, when you say that's that's incredibly arrogant uh, to assume that politics could ever be that uh, germ that universal, so to speak. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you know, progressivism, and this was this was a part of it uh, that you know politics needed to become more rational, more scientific. We really didn't need to have these continuing ideological battles. We could get beyond that and uh, be about these goals of good government, clean government, uh, you know, distributing resources more broadly, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, so, so Ford kind of plays into that moment. Uh, Newberry, I guess, runs afoul of it, although he doesn't, uh, uh, you know, probably doesn't understand himself to be so. Uh, but yet he's, you know, trying to win uh, the election. Um, uh, so let's talk about, so when Newberry beats Ford in the Republican primary, uh, he then has to face him in the general election uh, because Ford has won the Democratic primary. Uh, and the general election, um, uh, you know, he, he, then, he then beats him there. And I'm curious to know and get your thoughts, because you mentioned World War I, uh, and Woodrow Wilson certainly criticized by many for his efforts in World War I with, with regard to civil liberties and stifling dissent, and yet he immediately moves against Newberry. Uh, I think you say he doesn't even wait for the general election to be over. What, um, one piece that uh, I found pretty amazing was um, how politicized the Justice Department was <laughs> in, um, in this case, where... Um, you know, working with the uh, Democratic National Committee, word is out that uh, we should uh, that uh, Democratic National Committee men should be working and ready to forward any instances they could find of campaign irregularities on the part of Republicans. That uh, the Justice Department is, you know, ready and willing to uh, take a look at this stuff, um, and so there are. Uh, you know, people out investigating uh, during the during the primary connected with uh, with that, and you know, the initial complaint that comes in about Michigan uh, doesn't instantly rise to the level of interest as far as the Justice Department is concerned. But uh, then, when the 1918 uh, Senate elections go against Wilson, making it clear that he's not going to have uh, the the kind of majority is going to to need uh, for uh, for the league potentially and certainly to uh, organize uh, to organize the Senate. Um, all of a sudden, uh, there's a, a lot of interest in the Justice Department and a uh, and a real effort to get this case uh, you know moving and prosecuted as uh, as quickly as possible. With the only question being you know whether they um, move to prosecute it in Michigan or or in New York, where Truman uh, where Truman Newberry was uh, was stationed during the war. 
Yes. Um, so the politicized Justice Department actually struck me as something um, yeah. new here, where we do know about civil liberties, but the, this kind of political prosecution seems to me to be something new. The political prosecution aspect of it, uh, and you write at great length about that, um, so I, I, one question, just a, a factual question. So what is the colorable claim raised by the government against Newberry? I mean, what, what does it seem like he's done? Uh, just sheer violation of the spending limits of the yes. Federal Corrupt Practices Act in both yes. the primary and the general election? Uh, the primary election, because uh, the general election was quite clearly run by the Republican Party in the, in the state, and so the uh, general election wasn't at issue. It was, you know, completely the primary, because that's where, because parties weren't involved, uh, you know, candidates or their organizations at this point, you know, raised and spent their own money. One um, word on this is that uh, this law was the 19, the, the the Corrupt Practices Act was sort of peculiar in that it left this giant loophole, and. It seemed as if that loophole was there with everybody's, you know, every you know, everyone involved in, um, <clears throat> in what debate there was about the legislation, and um, certainly it was possible for politicians to, for senators and house members to read legislation and know what it meant. Um, you know, left this loophole there. You know, basically. Uh, on purpose. It had to be. It's hard to imagine otherwise. So in effect, a loophole is, uh, I mean, this is uh, part of the conversation, it seems, with any campaign finance reform legislation is, you know, where does, you know, where does the politics end up going or how are those involved in legislation, you know, able to craft, you know, certain provisions that allow uh, influence to be exercised in new ways. Uh, mm-hmm. It seems with the Federal Corrupt Practices Act, so you've, it's, the focus is on spending. We usually think about, you know, now our, the focus tends to be limiting contributions to campaigns or to issue advocacy campaigns. And, of course, limiting spending seems to drive the money outside um, uh, or, or, or in terms of limiting spending of the, of the candidate but allowing you know, much larger contributions to come in. So that's, I guess, one avenue around that. And, of course, with McCain-Feingold, it seems to be, or some have argued, it allows uh, wealthy candidates to step in because they're actually not limited, or at least that's my understanding. Yep. Uh, yep. So that's, I mean, I guess that's in play. So uh, Truman Newberry, uh, he beats the rap, uh, but but barely. And and there's also an attempt by the Senate, uh, retroactively you write about, to, in effect, impose a 100% tax on campaign expenditures, which uh, certainly yeah. would send a <laughs> – uh, yeah. certainly would uh, scare anyone from running – uh, for any federal office, if you know, if you see that happen, uh, it's 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 a chilling device. Yeah, and uh, I was uh, interested to see that there still are uh, some you know, law professors you know, pursuing that idea as maybe you know attacks on campaign contributions as one way of limiting uh, contributions to campaigns. So through through the yeah through the tech yeah. and and that narrowly failed though right it was but it was yeah. a few votes short. Uh, yep. Of passing, and so uh, the, there's the, they fail to get an indictment in New York, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Uh, they move in Michigan. Henry Ford gets involved, uh, which is, I mean, just seems to add to the sinister nature of this, with his mm-hmm. own paid uh, private investigators combing the state, trying to find evidence, and uh, and then actually they're able to bring a grand jury in Grand Rapids, Michigan, outside of uh, any Newberry influence uh, or people mm-hmm. who would know him or his family. And then they and, do, and they get uh, and managed to and managed to pick the uh, uh, decided that they wanted the the Ford people decided they wanted a uh, different uh, prosecutor found one who had had some success previously in um, in Indiana who would eventually also run for uh, public office as a Democrat in Indiana and so they you know found that they found uh, the right judge who had uh, basically announced that um, he thought the Newberry election was, um, um, you know, a scandal, and that Newberry, he basically announces that as far as he's concerned, Newberry had already broken the law. So it was, um, you know, uh, all but a foregone conclusion that there would be, you know, an indictment in this case. Ask you, uh, thinking about uh, Newberry, you know, barely uh, surviving, he, he holds on, he is indicted, ultimately he's exonerated, uh, because there's a ruling that the Federal Court Practices Act could not apply uh, to, to, to state prim- to primary elections. 
uh, which of course opens up uh, more unintended consequences. Then Newberry retires early. I think it's four years into his Senate seat. So just thinking more broadly uh, about this episode. I mean, so unintended consequences. I mean, that's almost a truism when we think about regulatory actions, and yet it, you know, it never seems to really break through to people when they're thinking of grand objectives. Uh, so I just I'm interested to hear your thoughts on unintended consequences of the Federal Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, in this regard, uh, because it seems to me they're all over the place in your book. Yeah, uh, unintended consequences uh, in the ruling itself, where the, uh, I think there would have been uh, a, a unanimous verdict that the uh, federal judge in the Newberry case had completely misread the statute, um, that the statute didn't apply to... Uh, the campaign organization it could it only applied to individual candidate spending and the uh you know judge for reasons of his own um went off and decided that uh it it applied to uh the campaign organization and so that there would have been a unanimous uh uh court in that instance that would have sent it back to a uh, to a rehearing, and at that point we probably would have had a you know pretty much clean um, uh, mm-hmm. would have been interesting in terms of you know consequences that didn't happen it would have uh, caused the uh, Senate and House to really confront what campaign what what they were trying to do with campaign finance. This way they could skate by and decide that this piece of meaningless legislation would, you know, carry on and be, uh, and they would go back and uh, revise it in the in the 1920s, and it would remain into the, um, in, you know, to the 1970s as this, you know, completely, um, you know, ineffective piece of legislation, but uh, there it was, there it existed, and so, you know, um, Congress was able to, you know, get away without confronting that. Um, so, in that sense, an, in, uh, an unintended consequence that you know kind of didn't happen. Uh, unintended consequences also in that deciding that primary elections, the way the court, the way we got to a four-four, four-five kind of decision uh, on this case was that primary elections weren't elections as uh, uh, the Constitution described, and they were instead the activities of private organizations, that is, political parties, which opens the door then to southern white primaries, which would, um, in uh, southern states, would be on that one, and it would uh, carry on until the 1940s. Oh, uh, uh, that uh, what, what, what question I wanted to ask you. Uh, so in your research, I mean, going forward from 1918, do we see... Uh, because of the Federal Corrupt Practices Act and the precedent set by this campaign, uh, more active campaigns. I mean, is that is that another uh, way people shift to the spending limits and the, the particular loopholes that are open in that act? Do, do we actually get the thing progressives don't want, uh, which is a, a more competitive politics, more personality-driven politics, uh, mach- you know, uh, campaign the, machine-type politics? Um, you know, the other irony here is that... Uh, Sure, it uh, leaves everything open for uh, media politics, advertised politics, and if uh, progressives uh, really meant what they often talked about in terms of how politics ought to be nonpartisan and rational and issue-driven and all of that, instead what we get is a politics that's media-driven and personality-driven. And so, uh, you know, that where advertising is... Uh, What's what's essential? On the other hand, if you've also gone ahead in terms of another irony of progressive reform and decided that um, parties should be curbed in uh, whatever in uh, in their influence, then uh, what do we have other than advertising? Uh, campaigns still have to communicate with uh, a public. Uh, candidates still have to get their their message out and so advertising comes in and uh you know fills uh fills that gap where parties um 
you know, with the primary system are no longer, you know, you know effective in being uh, in uh, not you know, not as effective as they had been in. Uh, <clears throat> so that's interesting. Advancing uh, tanner disease and so forth. Uh, and thinking, I mean, I, I guess I've read the story, and I, I, I haven't I haven't read it in a while. I mean, so if you were thinking of running uh, for office, say before um, the Federal Corrupt Practices Act or before even the Tillman Act, uh, I'm assuming you know you and you know, so there were probably very few disclosures or things that you know you had to do. Uh, you know, basically, you passed the hat around and and you got going. I mean, there, there, you know, there was just there was an open field. It was, uh, you know, o- you know, open to anyone. Uh, but the party was heavily involved, I assume. And yeah. but but it seems to me there's also there's this an opening for diversity in the sense of you could get a real challenger candidates uh, who weren't limited or burdened by a lot of regulation or a lot of spending limits or a lot of contribution limits. I mean, that seems to me a huge irony of campaign finance legislation that it actually limits the field to the connected, to those who have really made a life out of politics? Uh, uh, I guess that... Or th- that's just my observation. <laughs> I, could, I don't yeah. know. I've, I've, I've wondered that. I've thought that. Um, in the, the, uh, the wild card here is, uh, is communication, I think, more than finance. Mm-hmm. Okay. Where uh, the press is basically partisan. Uh, connected with the p- political parties, funded by the political parties until about the 1850s or so, and with still a fair amount of you know, party funding that happens after that. Um, before that, there's kind of straightforward, you know, parties are the press, <laughs> you okay. know, um, uh, to, uh, to about the 1850s or so. After that, it's a little more mixed, uh, but uh, getting... Chances are the press is still pretty partisan until about the you know, 1890s, and then we begin to see a bit more of an independent press. And uh, do you think we lose but, something? I mean, when we're do talking you... about uh, funding, um, yeah. uh, the the question is sort of money for what, and uh, money for what at this point is increasingly by the uh, you know 19. 19- 1900s on forward, it's uh, it's for advertising and to, and it's and in the primaries it'll be for organization as well, because uh, uh, it, you know money in its uh, uh, by it, uh, money is used for something and um, and the and that that something it strikes me is as is you know completely legitimate. Um, yeah. Uh, that is, you know, advertising an organization. Um, and uh, the need for candidates to go ahead and create their own, own organizations as opposed to party organizations, which does, you know, potentially open things up, um, happens with primary elections. But that in, and that plus um, an increasingly independent press gets us to, you know, political advertising as, as uh, the important venue for, so making yourself known to voters. The, the the partisan press does it decline as a consequence of campaign finance legislation? Or I mean, it seems to me it could be a good no, thing to have a partisan press. Uh, I mean, yeah, that sounds it's, it's, or counterintuitive to most people. But. Yeah, it's uh, it's happening more or less uh, uh, independently of that, where okay. uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 press is uh, on one side able to. You know, newspapers are able to go ahead and um, support themselves through commercial advertising, and you know, and political advertising turns out to be a kind of bonus <laughs> that uh, that they that they wind up getting as well. So, uh, going forward, uh, and thinking, I guess I'm still trying to think of uh, consequences of this Michigan race. So, campaign finance reform. Those who maybe we can say you know, the Baptist and also the bootlegger. So what do they learn from this episode? I mean, you, I guess you say the Federal Corrupt Practices Act is reformed in the 1920s, but largely stays on the books. Uh, is, that, is that the major piece of campaign finance restrictive type legislation that we have uh, until you know, later attempts in the later 20th century? Uh, or, or other things come online or other ways uh, come on to try and you know, you know, uh, shape this process? Uh, there are smaller revisions where, uh, in the in the 1930s, uh, a coalition of 
uh, conservative, or at least conservative in this sense, uh, in this connection, uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, look to, and then in the 1940s, look to limit the uh, ability of unions to contribute to political campaigns. That crops up as an issue in the 1930s, also limits on the political participation of um, office holders or you know, um, or civil servants that also uh, crops up in the 30s. So there's that, but as far as the spending limits and such, that's all just a kind of, you know, dead letter until okay. the contribution limit approach then in the in the 1970s. There are people um, working on this and there are hearings held and all of that uh, through yeah. Uh, the 1950s into the 1960s, but uh, nothing arises out of it. Um, the more uh, the shorter-term consequences of, of this is that it taught the Senate that you really could get rid of um, people who, for whatever reason, uh, the Senate found to be or the House found to be um, it's so politically uh, objectionable. Much, yeah, objectionable, <laughs> yeah. pretty much by yeah. their own life. <laughs> yeah, and 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 here and also uh, a threat a threat to your political career as we as we discussed at the beginning. Yeah, to your so, fortunes. Yes. So Newberry is not uh, the uh, even though he's in that sense cleared by the Supreme Court, the Senate um, goes back and runs other hearings and with uh, changes in the. Uh, and the composition of the Senate with uh, the, the 1922 elections, it seemed clear that yet another round of hearings was going to happen. And so at that point, he uh, resigned uh, office and uh, went back to private life and really never uh, had much to do with politics ever again, in contrast to Ford, who carried on a kind of quixotic political career. Um, uh-huh. But... The, the, the Senate would look back at uh, other candidates who plainly hadn't violated this uh, this law, whose campaigns were uh, legal, but decided that they can uh, that the Senate could use its power uh, to act as judges of its own members to uh, go after them as well. And uh, and campaign finance issues tended to be kind of a little hanging fruit because hey. Uh, basically, everybody spends more than what the what the limit was, unless it's uh, you know an election in the South that's basically uncontested, or some places in the in the North where where elections were pretty much uncontested. So uh, okay. there are a number of heads that roll um, in that connection through the uh, through the 1920s, and it showed no sign of uh, of ending really until the Democratic majorities in the um, in the 1930s, where the chances of removing a person uh, would be advantageous, would uh, tip the balance of, uh, of of the Senate or the or the House, uh, when that was no longer at issue. Basically, this be, you know, this this uh, set of Senate or you know, congressional prosecutions comes to an end, um, and. Uh, the ability of of Congress to do this uh, remains kind of uh, up in the air. None of the people who lost their seats decided to challenge the uh, challenge what the what Congress had done in the courts, and uh, that doesn't uh, happen finally <clears throat> um, until the until the 1960s. So, so uh, the McCain-Feingold legislation. Uh, remains on the books there's I mean, we've had we see unintended consequences uh coming out of that of course your book i think provides a way really to think about uh overall uh campaign finance reform and and the various approaches to it and, and what it could lead to I, i'm curious to know i mean as as we end uh I, i'm just thinking i mean so is what, what is uh, or what are maybe some finer points of of how to think about reform or, or how to think about uh, campaigns and, and issue campaigns in general. I mean, is it, I mean, is it something like full disclosure? Has some have advocated and allow uh, really no limits, or is it uh, you know uh, the voters are informed? We have uh, numerous ways, an infinite number of ways to to get information, aggregate information, analyze it, and and we should just let things proceed as they will. <laughs> 
Um, I guess I have a couple of thoughts on this. Um, one is that thinking about money in a vacuum is a, is a mistake, that uh, money communicates uh, a lot of things. It communicates uh, whether or not a, a candidate is viable, whether or not a candidate has support. So uh-huh. it's um, you know a message in that sense. But otherwise, it's worth keeping in mind that uh, uh, campaign funds uh, are spent for something, and and this and what they're uh, uh, spent on is uh, again generally you know organization offices, volunteer you know, organizing volunteers, campaign workers, all that kind of stuff, as um, as well as advertising in all of its forms. And do we uh, really want a system that makes um, that process uh, so? complex that in order to run for office um you know we need a you know a team of lawyers to yeah, make sure that point. everything is is uh is straight and narrow uh and also in connection with that whether how the, the system we have in place ha- you know what flows from that is a string of consequences and shapes how campaigns make decisions how they uh how they organize how they you know reach out to voters how they uh interact with interest groups um uh, and it money is not in a vacuum it, it's it's mm-hmm. connected with all of these things and um uh, thinking about those connections strikes me as um uh, as really important in any kind of campaign finance regime on the other hand the um uh, disclosure spend what you want um uh, it seems to me we've also seen with the disclosures. I mean, uh, it could be creepy. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you know, if you think about, you know, let's say it's like 1950s. Uh, let's say you're in Alabama and you've, you know, you've given money uh, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to the NAACP. Uh, you know, I mean, the Alabama state legislature tried to force those contributions to be publicly available. Uh, mm-hmm. I can't remember if they actually succeeded in doing that. Of course, now you're at risk in a lot of ways. And, and like as we saw in, in the California um, uh, amendment to the California state constitution prohibiting same-sex marriage, we saw uh, mm-hmm. a lot of attempts so to, to, yeah. to publish names people had contributed to the uh, campaign to prohibit same-sex marriage, and, and a number of them lost their jobs. Uh, I remember one I was reading about, she was a chef at a major restaurant in LA, and she ended up for her for the sake of the restaurant, just resigning. Uh, so, I mean, all of that stuff is in play. Uh, you know, and also, you mentioned at the, at the beginning of your answer, thinking about the, the army of lawyers. I can remember being at a, a speech I heard Bradley Smith give a number of years ago, uh, where he, he, he read a letter in the course of the speech uh, from a challenger candidate who had served in the Marine Corps. Uh, he, had, he had been in Gulf War One, wanted to run as a challenger candidate in a, in a primary and ended up running afoul of a lot of the regulations, largely because uh, it, it seemed of, of just not having the resources to deal, to report properly and, uh, you know, keep his information, et cetera, and be able to, you know, uh, give it to the FEC in, in the manner demanded. Uh, and, and almost incurred some significant liabilities. And, and the letter from this young Marine was, in effect, I can only conclude that the import, uh, the meaning of these regulations is to keep a lot of people out of the process. Uh, to keep challengers out, and I, I think you know when you when you think about it, I mean, of course, people have a lot of intentions and meanings, but that seems to be unavoidable, and all and a lot of this. Yeah, yeah. and uh, one other one other point. A while back, uh, in a collection of essays, I did a piece on the 2008 Obama campaign, or took that as a kind of jumping off point to mm-hmm. um, talk about the. Uh, how uh, it seems as if, you know, kind of two progressive era ideas, the secret ballot and uh, campaign finance reform, uh, are increasingly at odds. And and so you contribute to a campaign, and increasingly, particularly with technology and the Internet, we're you know, encouraged to, <laughs> um, uh, and it's made, you know, easier for small contributions to, uh, as well as... Uh, as well as some larger ones to uh, yes. fund campaigns, but that information is publicly available. And I was also kind of uh, struck to learn that if you go to the FEC website, it's easy enough to yeah. uh, find the small contributions too, even though they're not you know, reported, not yeah. supposed to be uh, public yeah. in the in the same way. You just 
uh, I was just fooling around and um, you know was searching on some zip codes and all of that. Um, and it was something that first came to my attention in looking at a uh, you know read, I was out of town and reading a newspaper and I was wait a second why is there this list in this paper of people who had given $100 contributions to one campaign or another. I'm like, wait a second, this isn't supposed to be reported, right? Hmm. Uh, I go to the FEC website, and there it is. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah. searched. Uh, and so we, uh, so at that point, what happens to the secret ballot? Maybe everybody's okay with this, but are they really? Yes. Well, certainly, I mean, a lot of times, uh, Google, I mean, information comes to yeah. people who have given, you know, 2500 5000 that seems... But, uh, I, always, I, mean, yeah, I guess that's but, legal, but I guess that always seems to me like, oh my gosh, okay. Uh, yeah, and then, yeah. And then uh, but uh, but even the smaller contributions where smaller. someone says, okay, I'm going to give $199 and uh, fall beneath the uh, the reportable limits, and whoops, nope. Yeah. Um, and uh, and from there, of course, um, <clears throat> you Google the names, come up with Facebook pages. Exactly. <laughs> you put, yeah. You put, yeah, you put together a political profile. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Paula, it was great talking with you and, uh, and, and about your book, about this campaign of 1918, about campaign finance reform. Uh, thank you so much. The book is Curbing Campaign Cash, Henry Ford, Truman Newberry, and the Politics of Progressive Reform. Thank you. Thank you. This is your host, Richard Greinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.